Welcome, everyone. The ICMA Learning Lab is pleased to present this online education program, Strategic Planning in the Age of AI, brought to you by ICMA strategic partner, Zen City. For technical assistance, please email learning at icma.org. Today's presentation will last up to 60 minutes and includes a question and answer opportunity. So please submit your questions at any time throughout the presentation using the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen. During Q&A, our presenters will answer as many questions as time allows. It is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator and the former ICMA Executive Board President, Lee Feldman from Zen City. Lee, welcome to the program. Thank you, Julian. Uh, hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, I am currently the Senior Advisor for Local Government Strategy for Zen City. And Haley, if you can show our uh, uh, shameless self-promotion slide. Uh, so Zen City, just for everybody's benefit, is a company that has pioneered AI in the uh, government space. We currently work with over 300 governments worldwide and have been recognized uh, with the GovTech 100 award for several years in a row, I think five at this point, and, uh, and have just recently been identified by CBI Insights as one of the one 100, one of the one 100 companies that, uh, that have been innovative in the AI space. So with that, let us uh, make some quick introductions and then we'll start with some opening remarks. And while everybody is, uh, is introducing themselves, uh, I'd like to pose a question and have you respond in the webinar chat. And, you know, I'm not sure how much everybody really knows about AI today, but I would, uh, I would ask you a question. Do you think that AI helps or hinders you or will help or hinder you in your day-to-day -day, uh, work life. So with that, if you want to throw in a response into the, uh, the webinar chat, uh, we can get some dialogue going. And uh, with that, I see a lot of helps. Uh, let's do some introductions. So here we back to the intro slide. So again, I'm Lee Feldman. I'm a former city manager. I was a city manager in uh, North Miami, Palm Bay, Fort Lauderdale, Gainesville all Florida cities, and also had the pleasure and honor of serving as the president of ICMA uh, back in 2016 and 17. Uh, Tim, do you want to make a quick introduction? Sure, thanks, Lee. Uh, yeah, my name's Tim Booker. I'm up in Canada, in Vancouver. Uh, from about 2018 to 2021, I ran a company called Civil Space, which is a civic engagement tool. Uh, we all joined the Zen City crew uh, in late 2021, and for the last two and a bit years, we have been uh, building community trust with our, uh, with our teammates at Zen City. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, AI and look forward to that in a few minutes. I'll pass over to Toby. Good morning from Arizona. Good afternoon to those of you outside of our area. I'm Toby Cotter. I'm the city manager here in Bullhead City, Arizona, where I've been the city manager for 14 plus years now. And uh, before that, I was uh, in Wisconsin. For those of you who remember me back in the Richfield, Wisconsin days, uh, I'm happy to be here and look forward to a great conversation. Thank you. Florencia? Hi, um, I am Florencia Rulo. I am the communications manager for the town of Nantucket. I have been working for the town for the last seven years. I started in town administration as the public outreach coordinator. And now I oversee the communications office where we work on, we're in charge of the website, social media, outreach campaigns, both uh, digital, audiovisual, and printed um, educational campaigns. So very excited to talk about our experience with AI and Sun City. Great, thank you. So I'm just going to spend about two minutes, maybe three, uh, just sort of trying to set the framework about uh, my my thoughts about how uh, AI and strategic planning walk hand in hand. So one of my favorite planners out there, and, and yes, city managers do have favorite planners, uh, was Jane Jacobs. I think we're all pretty familiar with the great work that she did uh, years ago. Uh, she had this quote that, that still today inspires me and sort of talks about the space that I'm in these days. And it's, while you are looking, you might as well also listen, linger, and think about what you see. Right, so she basically talked about how to how she walked the streets of a city, and she would just walk and look and listen. 
right? And then I want you to sort of think of that concept for a second as we look at this next slide, which is really representative of our uh, communities. Uh, Haley, thank you. This bell curve. So, you know, bell curve uh, really shows that every community, and I think you can sit back and make this analysis in your own, is that about 10% of our population is, is positive. 10% is negative, right? The positive 10%, you can have a pothole on every street and they're going to call that traffic calming. Negative 10%, you can pave the streets in gold and there's going to, they're going to complain that there's too much glare on the road. But we have 80% of our population in the middle. So as you're working on strategic plans, which are basically a lot of input and feedback loops on their input from, from the entire community, how do you reach that 80% and feedback? How do you get the feedback from that 80% that's in the middle that we generally don't hear from? Can you use AI to do that? Can you be a Jane Jacobs uh, charged with AI? And so in addition to your own eyes, in your own ears, in your own senses, can AI help augment and supplement those so that you have a much better uh, input and feedback loop as you're doing your strategic plan. So as we go through today's presentation, I'd like you to keep that in the back of your mind and sort of think about your own city, your own town, your own county, and how you sort of can merge AI into these really fundamental tasks that we have during strategic planning. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, you know turn it over to Tim Booker, one of my uh, my co-workers at Zen City, to sort of talk about AI. And, and candidly, it's taken me a long time just to learn how to spell AI. So Tim is really going to just give us a little primer into, you know, what is AI and what can it mean for us today? So Tim, it's all yours. All right. Thanks, Lee. Uh, I don't know how to follow up with an AI Jane Jacobs, but I will do my very best. All right. So I uh, First of all, looking in the chat, seeing people from uh, all over the USA, I just want to thank you, everyone here, for for giving up some time today uh, and for listening and sharing with us. I think it's going to be a great session. Uh, my part of the session that I'm going to share now is really just setting the stage for uh, the two great clients who are going to share after me. So I'm just going to walk through a little bit of what AI is and hopefully expand all of our horizons on what some of the possibilities are. So. The first question to ask really is, what is AI? You know, it's a term that was coined in 1955, uh, but often what we have are, we have these preconceptions in terms of AI based on what the latest tool or the thing is that we're used to. For example, right now, chat GPT might be all the rage. And so we associate, you know, AI with chat GPT, but uh, AI is more than that. Essentially, AI is any ability for a machine to be able to function in a way that our cognitive uh, system or our brains can. And so if you jump to the next slide, Haley, when we think about brain functions that uh, AI starts to take on, we think about things like reasoning, learning, problem solving, perceiving, interacting with our environment, even exercising creativity. And all these things are you know, amazing capabilities that you know, we have as, as humans with brains, uh, but are tremendously difficult to try to replicate. And then even as we replicate them, we find that they actually gain way more of their capability and power when combined. So if you want to jump to the next slide, uh, one of the examples that I think many of us have seen over the last, I can't remember, maybe five years is this guy. And this may be inspiring to people. It may also be terrifying um, uh, because of the capabilities. Um, but if you really think about it from that last slide, if you think about capabilities such as being able to perceive the environment, uh, being able to sense, being able to learn, and then you start to combine that with things like uh, mechanical engineering and you start to build something like a robot that is uh, super capable, you start to see how the power of AI is uh, is amazing, but you also see how it's bigger than a tool like, say, just ChatGPT. All right, to the next slide. Another example that we probably most of us have in our house or on our phone, um, but whether it's one of these little pucks or whether it's just a voice that's chirping back to us is our voice assistants. And once again, we're looking at things like 
breaking down the responses that we are giving or the questions or the requests that we're giving uh, into natural language using natural language processing. And then we're looking at establishing intent based on what someone's asking and then trying to associate what type of reaction or information or service can be performed. And all of those were probably codified using AI. So many different pieces and so many different facets of AI are used with some of these interfaces and functionality we're used to. So now that we're kind of opening our minds a bit um, uh, to how maybe big and wide AI is, I'm gonna get a little more technical for a few slides. So. Uh, if you want to go to the next one, Haley. All right. So we know AI is more than just chat GPT, but I want to kind of start out zooming out progressively. So when we look at chat GPT, it's actually one of many LLMs or large language models. So if people are familiar with that term, it essentially means the ability for these, um, uh, for these programs that have been trained on just massive amounts of, of data, massive amounts of textual data over centuries, over genres, over languages, and that they both have the capability to understand what we are uh, asking of them and also to create responses. And what's interesting in the LLM space is that there are more than just ChatGPT. Uh, there's Google's BERT and T5 and Transform Excel. Facebook has a derivative of BERT. Carnegie Mellon and Microsoft have some popular LLMs. And then what's also interesting is that LLMs then get customized often by particular industries or companies so that they can be used more specifically. So AI bigger than ChatGPT, there are many different LLMs. Now let's zoom out from LLMs uh, further on the next slide. All right. So LLMs or large language models, they fit into this first group of AI models, which are generative models. And generative models are amazing because what they can do is they can create something that hasn't existed before. They're going to be trained on all sorts of pre-existing material and content and media. And what they're going to be able to do is create text or images or numbers or audio or video or any co website code or any types of things that... Uh, they can potentially be trained to do, which makes them super valuable and which makes them super in the spotlight right now. But I also want to highlight discriminative AI because it is a really important part of AI and how AI has evolved over the years. And discriminative models are more trained on data that's labeled to be able to classify things into groups or categories. And if we move into the next slide, I'll give an example of that. So the way that these models get intelligent is often through learning. And so one of the terms you've probably often heard about in the AI space is machine learning. And so but what, what does that mean and why is that important? And it's because we're often used to computers performing tasks in a very predefined way. You know, we write code and the code then operates the way that we programmed or intended it to. Whereas with AI, we're teaching it to learn to function in a way that uh, isn't necessarily something we pre-programmed it to do, but we've given it the capability to be able to learn. And within the machine learning space, there are actually different uh, facets. So for example, if we're looking at a more discriminative model um, uh, using something like supervised learning, we actually train our AI models on uh, data and then try to have it replicate the type of discrimination that we would have um, uh, in uh, with future data. So a great example there is fraud detection. You train an AI model on a whole bunch of transactions, with a whole bunch of metadata. These ones are fraudulent, these ones aren't, and then now it can hopefully detect which ones um, aren't on a new data set in the future. Um, with something like unsupervised learning, we're actually having the AI model um, work away and without predefined labels, discover connections and labeling on its own. And so a great example here is uh, Google News categorization uses unsupervised learning to be able to categorize its news posts. It kind of just comes up with those uh, categorizations and associations on its own. Reinforcement learning is another area of machine learning. And so you can maybe think of like the stock market here. So you would program a device with some sort of reinforcement. And so you're looking at a scenario where, you know, it makes trades and it's reinforced by which trades actually, you know, increase value portfolio over the long term. And then you have deep learning, which you've heard about. Um, uh, you've heard of, probably heard about Deep Blue and, you know, 
beating Kasparov in 1997, but this idea of being able to replicate neural networks, so the ways that our brain can have multiple nodes and sending messages to each other, um, uh, it's so powerful. And if you think about the large amounts of data that often need to be processed in environments like, say, autonomous vehicles, deep learning is required to be able to you know, understand from sensors what or video what is kind of actually happening all around us and being able to then have some sort of reaction to that. And so as you start to combine these kind of facets or elements or learning models within AI, you get these disciplines like natural language processing that we see in chatbots or computer vision that we would see in like identifying anomalies on x-rays or expert systems like say an automated um, technical support person to help you with your Wi-Fi and then the robotics example that I gave at the beginning. And so you start to really expand your horizons in terms of what AI kind of has done historically as we kind of built up to the amazing capabilities we have now and what some of those different tools could still help accomplish uh, in local government. If you want to go to the next slide, Haley. Now that the uh, the more technical part is over, maybe just a few misconceptions to correct in the AI space. And the first is that AI is magic. It can just figure out and do anything on its own. And I think we really need to establish that, you know, humans need to come up with algorithms and capabilities and human and AI also requires data to be able to activate its value. The, the training on massive data sets is so important toward, uh, toward AI's value. And connected with humans is this fear that AI will replace all our human jobs. And what we're seeing is we're seeing a job evolution as opposed to um, uh, kind of this complete job loss. And when we're looking in scenarios of like how to become a kind of valuable employee, we're looking at, uh, you know, shifts from jobs that uh, AI can replicate parts of to uh, roles where AI is actually a superpower where someone can harness the power of AI to increase their value in the workplace and to increase the capabilities of the company or government they work for. But we do also have to think about kind of the downsides or concerns like AI is not infallible and, and not inherently objective. AI is going to be trained on data. If that data is biased or incorrect, it's going to ruin the output, right? Garbage in, garbage out applies to AI as well. And then we're also need to be thinking about the implementation of AI, both in its technical simplicity, which it's not, there's a lot of complexity in terms of setting it up and customizing and training, but there's also going to be facets of things like uh, privacy and ethics and security and feasibility that we all have to think about as we implement AI in our workplaces. Next. All right, so just one more slide for me, and this is the kind of go full circle as we've kind of expanded our horizons in terms of what AI means, what it is, uh, looking at different areas that AI can help in local government. And three came to my mind right away. So the first is in content generation. So lots of us have to come up with content to communicate to our residents, and we wanna do that in an effective manner. And the ability to have AI generate content in a certain tone of voice um, uh, with a certain uh, capability to like identify uh, things that maybe we hadn't even thought of. And to do that really efficiently can have amazing side effects in terms of helping us to either communicate more on more issues, but also to be able to free up employees to have more staff and resident interactions. Uh, second, and this is another one in addition to content generation that is baked into the Zen City platform that we're super proud of, and that's automated analysis. So if you're looking at natural language processing, the ability to have models that break down input, like I'm sure the last five or 10 years, many of you has been about data, data, data. We're bring, we need to get more data into the organization. And one of the challenges with more data is, well, how do we extract value out of that? How do we make better decisions based upon it? And often there's this gap in understanding. And so automated analysis or AI powered text analysis, many different names, but the essentially the ability to discover themes and challenges and break down and theme and group data in ways that would take humans a long time and maybe wouldn't identify as many possibilities. Uh, AI can be really powerful at that. 
And the third emerging area, which is really exciting to me, is modeling. So all of us are experiencing population growth or population change, demographic changes in our communities. And we always need to be looking ahead 5, 10, 15, 20 years and anticipate, okay, for education or for transit or for water or for public safety or, or, or healthcare, we're going to have different needs and those needs are going to be changing. And AI can be very powerful in the sense of being able to help us model out different scenarios, which can then help us to make effective plans for the future. And with that, I will pass back to Lee. Well, wow, that that was that was a lot, Tim. And uh, I've been basically got a couple of hours worth of AI uh, <laughs> in there. So be, before we get on to Toby, I just got a, a couple of questions uh, for you. First, did you okay. did you use AI to actually generate those slides? I did not use AI to generate my presentation. No, um, uh, I did think a little bit about uh, the the people who might be attending today and trying to really customize the content to them. But I did use a bit of AI to generate some ideas and make sure I wasn't kind of missing anything. And there were a few suggestions uh, that it gave me that I kind of filled in some gaps. Great. And, and you know, what, um, I think Eric uh, Gildersley posed a question in the webinar chat about, um, about if any cities out there have developed policies uh, regarding the use of AI. And one of uh, one of his examples was privacy issues. Hmm. Uh, Tim, can, can AI actually uh, help protect privacy, or does it sort of is it another way of sort of invading privacy? I would say this. I would say AI introduces privacy risks that we need to manage um, uh, within our cities, and so. Uh, one of the ways that as a provider at Zen City who's you know, hoping to assist uh, cities who are our clients is we're often thinking about where our data goes, right? And we want to make sure that data, especially if it's flowing from residents into cities into our platform, we want to be very careful about where that ends up. And so as we have embraced the AI revolution and added new capabilities, one thing that we were actually really careful about is when we were interfacing with ChatGPT, with OpenAI, which we used to enhance and augment some of our product, uh, we made sure to use a provider um, uh, that allowed us to opt out of the client's data going back into the training of the model. And I think that's really important. And I totally get the value of wanting um, uh, to help train models, you know, to make them better in the future. But our clients have a lot of trust in us. And so we made sure that as we were kind of extracting value out of uh, the algorithm, out of the service, that we were not putting any sort of client private, you know, personally identifiable information or any of our client information um, uh, back into the model to train it. So I, I'd say there's probably a myriad of ways to, that you want to assess the risk, but there's, that's just one that came to mind right away when you said privacy, that it's probably important to know how your data, where, where the data ends up that ends up going through these algorithms. If you have your own, you know, if you're lucky enough to have your own kind of capabilities on site, that may be less of a concern. But if you're using external services, you might want to look into how they process your data and if the data ends up going back into the greater pool. So, so Tim, touch on that for one more second, because I think we're all sort of you know, neophytes when it comes to uh, AI and things like chat GPT, you said a minute ago, uh, selecting a provider, right? It, so there's providers that provide chat GPT. Mm -hmm. uh, right? And then you, but it's really the government just doesn't pick up G GPT, chat GPT or some other product. You have to find the provider as well. Yeah. So specifically with us, we're kind of working at more of a enterprise scale in the sense that we have many different uh, clients worth of data, you know, flowing through our system. And so we're connecting, you know, server to server with a, um, uh, with a chat GPT provider. And so in terms of connecting uh, server to server over API to that provider, we wanted to choose a provider where we're going to extract, extract the value out of um, uh, those calls to chat GPT, but we're not putting data back into their, um, uh, into their training. Great. So I'll confess, we did use chat GPT to generate this slide about how AI can help in strategic planning, uh, but wanted to put this out there for 
uh, for everybody to see, you know, all the different ways that in the strategic planning process, you can use different forms of, of AI. Uh, on that note, I'm going to turn this over now to Toby and uh, let Toby sort of talk about Bullhead City's uh, uh, strategic plan and how they're contemplating using uh, AI as they make their next endeavor. Very good. Thank you, Lee. And great to see everybody. I see over 300 participants, probably lots of people around a lot of different government buildings. So great to be with all of you. I'm Toby Cotter. I'm the city manager in Bullhead City, about 90 miles south of Vegas, 50,000 people and uh, millions of visitors a year. And we want to capture the data that those individuals bring. So get ready for a quick 10 minutes of AI from me. I am not the expert in the field. I bet you of the 304 people listening right now, so many of you have more uh, knowledge and have used AI more than I. But over the last few months, I've immersed myself in it. Thanks to Lee and the team at Zen City. We've been a Zen City customer for a long time. Not a plug, but just the reality. But we also use Placer.ai and a number of different uh, artificial intelligence to help us be a better city. I just want to start out with a quick example. On New Year's Day, I went to Smith's. We all maybe buy chicken wings, right? So I buy these chicken wings at Smith's. I put in my card, right? Your phone number. And then later that afternoon, not more than an hour later, I go on X or Twitter, just looking at some information. And lo and behold, the ad that I get is an ad for air fryer paper liners. So Smith's and Twitter know me and they know that I needed a paper liner when I was gonna go home and cook those chicken wings. I'd never seen that ad before. I've not seen it again. So obviously something happened there. I also went to the gas station recently and put in my phone number at lo the local Maverick and an ad come up came up for my favorite coconut water. Come inside and buy your coconut water. So things are starting to become very apparent to me that AI is hitting our daily lives. I was on a recent flight on Southwest Airlines and there was a movie. I just clicked it. I'm like, oh, I'll watch that one. It looks exciting. I just want to play the trailer for you real quick. The next marvelous advancement in robotics is artificial intelligence. We should never have let AI out of the box. Execute her or we go extinct. Not killing the kid. What do they call you? What's your name? My name's Alfie. You're my friend? She said you want me. They're coming to get me. Keep out. Well. What do you want, sweetie? I don't feel like that's to be free. We don't have that in the fridge. How about ice cream? The future never looked better. The future never looked better. The future never looked better. The Creator, rated PG-13, only in theater September 29th. If you haven't seen that movie yet, I highly recommend it. It really fits in with the theme of today's presentation. It has nothing to do with strategic planning, except for the fact that robots are becoming human. You saw the dog at the beginning of the presentation. New York actually bought that dog, employed that dog, and has since taken that dog off the street. But just think about that dog if that dog would have been employed the in Uvalde. Or another one of our school shootings. Could we have sent that robot dog in to save lives? Maybe that's a great use of AI. So that's a little bit broader. And it, I mean, talking about paper liners and gas stations and, you know, sort of a far-fledged movie, it doesn't seem all that real. But remember the first time you heard of autonomous cars? Remember the first time you saw a car without a driver? Now semis without drivers. Airplane pilots? I mean, all of these things are happening. And what are we going to do in government? not only to create policies, but to regulate it and work on those policies with our city council. So let's talk specifically, and let's give a couple examples of AI. Um, and, and so here is simple, we'll go to ChatGBT, and this is 3.5. Um, here on my report, I was looking at single family residential valuation. So here's a report, a few years of residential valuation helps with uh, those communities who collect a property tax. So just simply ask the question, prepare, analyze and prepare a report on single family residence valuations for new home construction in Bullhead City. 
cut and paste it literally took me a, a minute to do that. And then ChatGBT gives this analysis. So what used to be done by hand, by a human, now this AI through ChatGBT, and there's many other programs as was previously suggested, they're talking and giving a great report on uh, commercial residential valuations. I didn't have to format the code. I didn't have to do anything but go to openai.com and uh, submit that information. So it's an easy example. So one takeaway, um, especially, you know, there's a lot of communication folks on this call today. Let your city manager know that there needs to be, you know, an AI discussion at your local city hall. Do you have policies and procedures? Are you using chat GBT or other programs in your lives? And so I'm of that 50 and over group. There's a lot of city managers and assistants in that category. We need to understand AI and understand how it's going to impact government. And there are some really, really great ways uh, that it does impact government. So I'm going to give another specific example of where old school strategic planning uh, meets AI. And then we'll come back to this if you don't mind. So let's talk about our new animal shelter. Uh, we were in the process of building a brand new building, had budgeted about $6 million for the new building. And then all of a sudden, one day, the local newspaper says they're downsizing, moving some of their publishing to another plant, and they were looking for a new office. Well, I went to bed that night thinking, what's going to happen with this beautiful 27,000 square foot facility? Woke up the next morning, called the mayor. I said, hey, meet me over at the newspaper. Let's go walk through. So we meet the publisher. We walk through, and I say to the mayor, this could be our new animal shelter. It is a beautiful building. I think we might, do we have a couple more photos uh, to show the inside? There's the lobby and there might be another one. You're right, there's the print room. So as part of that, okay, now we need a strategic plan for this, right? So it's just one thing, hey, it's the city manager wants to build a new animal shelter and thinks he can convert a 27,000 square foot a newspaper building into a shelter. So what did we do? First, you know, the traditional strategic planning, meet with the city council, have focus groups, and then we did the Zen City survey. And as you know, Zen City uses artificial intelligence on the back end of these surveys, and they also use it on their normal daily processes. And so as we went through the survey, we also got to see every day what people were saying about us on Twitter and Facebook. So you wake up in the morning, there it is. So here's what everybody's saying. So here's the new design of that newspaper building uh, based on all of the public input that we received and our new strategic plan. We did use ChatGBT and AI to generate some of those strategic planning questions um, and the survey questions. And you can see here, one of the great things that came out of this in this big building on the, on the left-hand side where it's the green paw, the sort of the sticking out on the left-hand side, that actually is a new veterinarian clinic. Because of the amount of work we put in the strategic plan and reaching out to our community, it became more than a shelter. It became the Bullhead Animal Resource Center, and we are going to be hiring a veterinarian and maybe more than one veterinarian. 98% of those who answered our survey said there's a significant lack of veterinarians, and the city council is 100% behind hiring more veterinarians and, and actually having them be civil servants. So here's an example of where that old school strategic planning, we can do this on our own. We can have focus groups, but there's also an incentive to use AI. In fact, you can actually just go to ChatGBT and say, help me form a strategic plan for a new animal resource center. I wanna talk just a little bit more about the private sector. Walmart recently released something that they're called in-home replenishment. And a lot of us buy things from Walmart online. And here you go. When you log on next time, if the gallon of milk is already in your cart, how did that happen? Well, Walmart was assuming because you buy a gallon of milk every week that you're going to need a gallon of milk this week. So you don't actually have to click through and find the gallon of milk. It'll be in your cart. So the private sector is going so strong on this. So when you can buy chicken wings at Smith's and the paper liner shows up in your Twitter feed, and when you can go to Walmart and your milk is already in your cart, the question us in government have to ask is where are we in these processes and procedure? And so as you're looking, as you're looking at using AI, 
Are there things that you can look at? Trash consumption. Are we meeting use and utilization? Can we run models for crime that predict crimes in certain areas and at certain times? And I know that's going to scare a lot of people because this predictive analysis models are scary. And sometimes they're very questionable. There was a recent example that I found where a police department actually took DNA and turned that it used AI to turn from that DNA and turn it into a face, an artist rendering of a face. And then they ran it through facial recognition software. What if that looked like me or Lee? We weren't there that night, but now we're having AI that our police departments potentially can A, catch criminals, but B, what are the implications of us allowing DNA to have the AI create an image and then we run facial, facial recognition on that image? Also, uh, the National Science Foundation put out that they have a database of over 6 million items from the internet. And in that database, if we were to use that, contains a whole bunch of illegal things, including uh, child abuse and child porn and all those things. None of us want to be anywhere near that. So we have to be very careful. And so my second takeaway is look at your policies and procedures. Don't ignore this anymore. I kind of was. I love having Zen City send me my daily uh, update on what's going on in the community. But when you really get to the heart of it, as was mentioned before, there are some outstanding tools. When you think about solar, we all have solar systems and solar modules in our community, especially here in Arizona. Some of those AI systems will make sure that it's pointed the right direction at the exact same, same time and not just be here at noon. It might actually be turned a different way using AI to better you know, create uh, power for us. I wanna go back to ChatGBT for just a moment and run another quick example, because a lot of you were here for strategic planning. And so here's another example of strategic planning. So the question that I have right now is we could really use another airline. And so the question that we put into the chat GBT is, how can Bullhead City recruit another airline to the Laughlin Bullhead City International Airport? What strategy should it employ? Create a strategic plan for recruiting another airline. Very simple question, right? So let's ask AI that question. And this is what it would say. And it's kicking out a strategic plan for me right now in front of all of you. This is what the city should do to, to strategically recruit another airline. And it's talking about service fee waivers and des destination marketing, airline partnership marketing, local support, public relations campaigns. Look at what it's kicking out. In the past, especially those of us who are city managers, We've hired people to do this, and uh, we've paid them a lot of money to do this. And I'm not saying it's still not necessary and needed, because it is. And once you have this, it takes great people, including our staff, to analyze this, change it, make it better, make it more usable for us. But then you can also ask it another question. So now that I've asked the, to create a strategic plan for me to recruit another airline, let's say, what about Sun Country Airlines? Let's ask it that question. Is Sun Country a viable option for expansion? It knows I'm asking it the question about my airport. It knows that I'm asking it about a specific airline and how I can further go after that specific airline for my airport. And this is free. And this is available to all of you right now. So why wouldn't we use this? Why wouldn't we uh, get a little trendy and use AI? And if you go to OpenAI, and take a look at it. If you're not, you're not doing a service to your community and to your staff. Again, it's not for everyone. It's not for every purpose. And people still have to engage with this. No AI in the world is going to go meet with Sun Country and move them to this airport. People will, but AI is helping us grow a strategy so that we can deploy those methods. And so I leave you with that. And again, uh, for those of us that are aging in our uh, years with uh, city management, uh, and I'll put Lee and I in that category, it's incumbent upon you to understand AI and get involved. And so again, I encourage all of you on this call, meet with your city management, go over a simple example like this and show them how AI can help your organization. Thank you very much. 
Thank, thank you, Toby. It's amazing to think that when you and I first started to get into the profession years ago, the, the, the big technology change was actually having personal computers at your desk um, on there. And so it, it's a, definitely an exponential curve. Uh, Hope Bernstein uh, posed the question, will we share the slide presentation after? The answer is yes. And I believe Julian has already put it into the webinar chat in a form that you could, uh, you could download. Florencia, you're up next. Now, Nantucket is currently in the process of doing their strategic plan. Um, you're going to talk to us a little bit about that and you share your thoughts as well. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Lee. Yes. So first, thank you all for joining us for a discussion on the strategic planning in the age of AI webinar. I am Florencia Rulo, communications manager for the town of Nantucket. For those of you that are not familiar to Nantucket, it's an island. It's 30 miles south sea of the coast of Massachusetts. So today I'll be talking about the strategic plan. We already have one, but we're in the process of um, learning how we can use AI to move forward with the implementation of the strategic plan. So while well, conversations of developing a strategic plan started a few years back, it was in October 2018 that the town of Nantucket Select Board developed its first strategic plan. Um, in it, we identified three focus areas, housing, environmental leadership, and transportation. Then between 2018 and 2020, the Select Board had several workshops to refine the concept of the plan and to identify other focus areas. In 2020, after half a year of pandemic, two other focus areas were implemented into the plan, quality of life and efficient town operations. Over the past five years, community engagement regarding the plan has been mostly unidirectional, with the town releasing a set of state of the town videos, strategic plan updates, workshops open to the public, and frequent social media posts and newsletter updates. While the plan has been well received and the focus areas are truly representative of our community or of or the concerns of our community, we are now looking to gather the public sentiment on each focus area. We want to understand their priorities within the plan. We want to be able to identify areas they don't see as a priority. We want to learn what needs adjustment or change and what's going in the right direction. Are we missing something that's fundamentally important to the community or is the plan responding to the needs and wants of our residents? We believe that AI can help us better analyze responses to the strategic plan. Next slide, please. So in collaboration with Sun City, we are in the process of developing a representative survey. That's what we're doing at the moment with Sun City with two goals that are very simple. We want to educate the community on the current strategic plan and we want validation from our community. Why? Because we understand that a two-way channel of communication will enrich the end result. Um, next slide please. Um, so I, as I explained before, the town strategic plan consists of five focus areas. The plan is fundamentally guided by the principle of sustainability that seeks to institutionalize practices that support a balance of the economic, environmental, and social health of our island. Some of these areas have been a priority for a little longer than others. Um, let's take transportation as an example. Um, as well, as I previously mentioned, Nantucket is an island. There are no bridges that connect Nantucket to the mainland. Nantucket does not have a regional transportation system. So transportation here takes a whole different priority. Um, for example, we started using Sense City um, January 2023, so or December 2022. It's about a year since we've been using it. And over the last 12 months, we created eight different project pages for eight different transportation projects that are currently ongoing on Nantucket. So each project allow us to have a, sur a survey or maybe more than one, depending on the topic, a public board or a discussion topic. Um, this type of outreach was followed by social media, printed campaign in multiple languages, 
Um, and this is the first time that we implement such a holistic and interactive plan of communication at such a large scale. And so far the results have been great. The transportation surveys results surpassed our expectations. Of course, of course, in the past we've used survey and survey platforms that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, but we are getting a much greater response rate and these results have even been noticed by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. We are, every survey goes about 80% response. So that's really very high. Um, and then, so we're getting a greater response when we put surveys out there. Now, do we have the manpower to analyze this data? Unfortunately, we do not. And that's when AI becomes incredible beneficial to our goal. AI algorithms can analyze large volumes of data, that's responses, quickly. They can recognize patterns, correlation versus anomalies. Automated analysis makes it so much faster to analyze open-ended survey responses. It can help us predict trends, learn from our residents' way of thinking in order to improve future surveys. It can help us personalize and segment surveys according to the public we want to reach to. And it automatically generates a report of the survey results, saving us valuable time that we then can use to actually learn from the data we collect. So basically what I think that is crucial to understand here is that AI is an active tool. It is useful as long as we learn how to use it. And as long as we use it, the more we use it, the more we learn how to, the more we understand the dynamic. So we'll get better results as we use it more frequently. So, um, well, these are just the first steps of the AI government relationship. I think that we should remember that AI is dynamic and having a long-term vision as a municipality uh, of how we want to use it for a local agency. Um, it's key. Um, so I think that we don't need to be afraid. We need to learn from it. We need to have a roadmap to what is that we're looking to achieve when we use AI. And we need to train our personnel and collaborate, collaborate within municipality, within municipality departments and municipalities that like we're doing right now. Actually, the chat is so enriching and I'm learning from others. Um, so for this year, what we have planned, we'll be releasing two city power surveys. The first is a strategic plan focus survey. I don't know if you're familiar with Sun City, but Sun City calls it a pulse survey. That's what we'll be doing. Um, we are aiming at educating residents on the current strategic plan and its latest update that just happened. And we want to gather their feedback and sentiment. And the second survey that we're planning on is a townwide community survey. That's the first ever for the town of Nantucket with the goals of engaging the community, aiding the strategic plan with the data gathering the survey, making decisions based on data. So basically our goal is to use AI in a way that will positively impact the efficiency of data collection. Again, we've said data way too many times, but it's important to understand that's what AI is basically, uh, and then how we process and analyze the data that we're collecting ultimately to better serve our communities. So that's a little bit of, of what I have, what the strategic plan is and how we're planning uh, to use AI to, to let our community know what the plan is. Thank you, Florencia. So, so you, you mentioned in their sentiment, uh, uh, analysis, and you had that slide up there. And it, one of the things that I've been amazed with through AI and natural language processing is the ability to detect sarcasm, right? So you could have somebody send in uh, or make a post on in social media that says, uh, thank you, uh, uh, or Metropolis, I have a, a, a pothole on my street. And we, we would assign that negative sentiment but also the ability to use natural language processing to denote sarcasm. So if somebody said, thank you, Metropolis, for another pothole on my street, 
we know that thank you is positive, but in this particular case, it's sarcasm. And it too would also get negative sentiment. So, you know, the ability to use uh, AI to you know process thousands and thousands of those interactions and assign sentiment, I think creates value uh, for us, uh, maybe, or creates more work for us, maybe, uh, as we uh, as we go on. Uh, I'd like to now turn over to uh, to Q and A. Uh, we have about ten minutes left in the uh, in the webinar, and we've got some questions that have appeared in. Uh, in the Q&A channel. Uh, one from Matt Dixon at uh, South Ogden City. Uh, he wants to know if you all find a particular LLM, such as ChatGPT or BERT, uh, to be more useful to local governments than others. So Toby, you, you chose ChatGPT 3.5. Right, that, yeah. So. Yeah, thanks, Lee. So the reason for that today was because it's free. And I wanted to make sure that everyone saw the free version. If you just go to openai.com, you can look at it. The premium version is 20 bucks a month. I subscribe and think it's a great resource, a great tool. So there's so many others. And, you know, not to say one is better than the other today, but in the chat box, you can go back to people what they were suggesting with their own opinions. But we wanted to show that there are use, some useful tools that are available today for free that you can ask very simple questions to, and you'll be amazed at how that'll help you with some strategic planning efforts. And as I said before, it doesn't answer all the questions and you need to you know, use your staff. And, and this is great because AI can help us and then our staff just kills it from there. Great. Florencia, are you using ChatGPT back in uh -huh. time? Yes, yes, definitely if I'm very familiar with ChatGPT. Uh, I use it, uh, people within my, um, within the town of Nantucket use it too. Um, it's interesting how many are asking about policies. I think that that's um, the next step for municipalities. We currently do not have one, but we're in the process of, of developing one with um, town council. Um, ChatGPT, the free version even, is great um, for those of us that started using it. As soon as it came out uh, to the public, we can see uh, the progress it had. I would say, I mean, we want to use it as a tool. Again, that to me is the important thing. I don't want to use it as the Bible. I want to use it as a tool, as something that, you know, you have to uh, be mindful when you're using it. and serve our purpose but then again we are eventually it's our responsibility whatever we decide to take from it or not great and tim you you use ai i mean you've you know you live and breathe this every day do you have a favorite uh i don't think i'm going to play favorites uh, i think to me it's more of a tool for the job scenario right so I know that we've used uh, BERT uh, in its area of strength in areas like um, uh, being able to recognize sentiment or being able to classify things, very powerful capability there. Um, but it's really hard to touch both the ease of use on the UX side and the, the generative power of chat GPT. But we're just talking text there, right? There's also like image creation stuff, which I know has its downsides, but also, you know, sometimes you need an image for... Uh, for an article or for something, and it's really helpful to be able to create something and not, you know, violate someone else's rights by, you know, taking their image on them. But to make something that's super relevant for you is can be really convenient. So I would just say picking the best tool for the job is great. And I've found uh, GPT-4 amazing personally, like it's a little more up to date, a little more capability. So uh, yeah, a lot, lot of, lots of great options out there. So, so, Tim, I'm going to ask you one of the questions that popped up here as well. Um, Jennifer asked, what AI platforms analyze data? And is Zen City an LLM? Do uh, you want to talk maybe a little bit about how we analyze the data out of our various uh, tools? All right. So without sharing all the secret sauce, um, uh, what I will say is that Zen City makes use of a number of different AI models. 
Um, uh, some that are more, uh, we're using connecting to off the shelf models that others have created, some that we've actually created and trained on our own. And we the, the key to the Zen City platform is it's not an LLM um, on its own. It's a whole suite of capabilities, some of which are programmed the old fashioned way, you know, to be able to uh, to take data in from you and to have uh, um, to have certain functionalities. Like, for example, when you're uh, uh, well, I, I shouldn't even I was going to say when you're building a survey, but now we even have capabilities with AI to help you with that. But there's lots of things that you would do in our platform that are more traditional in the way that it's kind of all uh, put together from a software engineering perspective. A lot of that is, you know, traditional programming, but it's kind of like sprinkling the AI magic in the places where it adds value, I think is how I would more classify the Zen City platform. So it's like, okay, it's going to be great to do AI powered moderation of collaborative, you know, ideation or conversation online. So we're going to use AI there. Or we're going to use AI to help generate content for press releases or AI to help classify open-ended posts into topics. So then that way you can quickly understand uh, what's going on in terms of the feedback you're being given or what things are emerging based on a certain question. So yeah, uh, Zen City is a, a technical platform with lots of different uh, technical capabilities and tools in it and has different AI uh, models and capabilities sprinkled throughout where uh, it makes the most sense in terms of adding value. And, and Melanie, uh, in the uh, webinar chat indicated that you have the coolest job. Uh, Tim, I think I actually have the coolest job because I get to just talk with you and learn mm -hmm. every day. I do uh, a very cool job. That is very true. So uh, we'll take one more question out of the uh, uh, out of the uh, Q and A, uh, and this comes from Nicole uh, Schaefer Granby. Uh, what data does she need to uh, have prepared to maximize AI for an outcome like educating and prioritizing prioritizing a comprehensive master plan? And can she upload a spreadsheet, for example? Uh, yeah, so. certainly she can, Lee. I mean, we just do, we just uploaded um, valuations for property from 12 years, and it simply crunched that within a moment's time. But it's not going to create your whole city's master plan. If you're not talking to your elected officials, if you're not talking to your residents, you started this out. You have to sit and look and listen. AI can't do it all. It can crunch a whole bunch of data for you, though, and save you time. So that really frees you up to go meet with your constituents, go meet with your community. Don't lose that. Yeah, I, I think you hit it on the uh, on the head. You know, if you go back to the Jane Jacobs quote I had in the beginning. You know, think of just AI as thousands and thousands of Jane Jacobs out there looking, listening, lingering on your behalf as you create your plan pulling in that input, creating that that feedback. Uh, I saw a couple other notes that are these slides going to be available later? Uh, they will be, and uh, as well as a recording of this webinar. Uh, we've got roughly a minute left, so I just want to thank uh, Toby and Florencia and Tim and the ICMA staff and the Zen City staff for putting all this together. And I hope that you all have a... Uh, come away with a, a better understanding of AI and some thoughts about how you can uh, implement it in your own strategic planning process. Uh, with that, Julian, I'll turn it back to you if there's any closing ICMA remarks. And with that, we must conclude today's webinar. A special thank you to our presenters and to everyone who joined us today, and we hope we'll see you again soon. Please take a moment to complete a brief evaluation of today's program by returning to the ICMA Learning Lab page where you logged in today. The survey must be completed to unlock your certificate for this program. After completing the survey, you can access your certificate via the Achievements tab at the top of the interface. A recording of today's session will be uploaded to the same place you found the Zoom link in the Learning Lab. Today's program is copyright 2024 by the International City County Management Association with all rights reserved. This concludes today's program. You may now disconnect.